Joining us now for his perspective in Montreal, Quebec, Serge Simon. He is the Grand Chief of the Mohawk Council of Kanesatake, and we welcome you, Chief Simon, to the agenda. How are you doing tonight? I'm fine, Stephen. Thank you very much. Not at all. It's good to have you there.
Do you think, uh, let's just start with this, do you think that uh, indigenous people, through their band councils, for example, should be buying into the oil sector? Uh, I believe it, uh, that would be an internal matter. It's uh, individual bands have to weigh the pros and cons. Um, we also see uh, some of the, the uh, decision-making process also relates to how much poverty is uh, within a First Nation community that leads them to either sign or not. Uh, it depends on the education uh, of, um, say, environmental issues, uh, treaty issues, There's many factors that come into making that kind of decision. So you don't have, uh, for example, a blanket prohibition against anybody buying in if they want to? Well, First Nations, uh, no. Um, I know that uh, industry has a way of coming in and convincing you uh, that this is in your best interest, uh, despite with what every scientist, uh, almost every scientist on the planet is telling us that uh, we should stop doing that. But uh, poverty is a, is a huge incentive to sign, right? So. At the end of the day for you, is the economic benefit to your people more important than whatever environmental degradation might have to happen as a result? Uh, well, the economy you got to look at, uh, you're going to base your economy on what? On natural disasters which are increasing every single year due to uh, the changing climate. Mm. You're going to base your economy on mitigating all of that just so you could keep moving oil and gas and so on. Uh, I don't think that's a good basis for an economy. I think uh, if you take a short-term hit uh, while making that transition, it'll be worth it for future generations. Then if you continue on this path and do nothing, well, you're not gonna have much of an economy to base yourself on. Well, in which case, in our last couple of minutes here, the, the, the key question, of course, is how to get from here to there. So if you were in charge, how would you get us off this fossil fuel dependence that we clearly have right now to get us to whatever is more benign for the planet? Uh, well, the first thing is uh, don't build any more pipelines. Uh, fix the infrastructure you have in place and start working at the transition. Hire some of the best economy, the best economists in the world uh, and work with the physicists and with the engineers. Now, once you find a way of harnessing the energy, creating a magnetic field uh, in a different way than using the generators you have today, uh, they talk a lot about zero point. They talk about uh, vacuum energy, uh, which physicists say is theoretically possible. You'd have abundant, I mean, never-ending um, energy uh, just about free for the entire planet, which I think would be a really nice step. And the economy would follow right behind it. If you're not paying uh, these large subsidies to industry for oil and gas to kill your environment, you're going to be taking those subsidies and you're going to put them in education and health and job creation, right? So mm. fossil fuels, they've done their time, okay? Now we have to go somewhere else. We have to. It's a matter of, uh, of survival for, for the entire planet. When companies make those entreaties to First Nations, for example, uh, how much suspicion do you think those entreaties ought to be taken with? Well, uh, it depends on the process that, that's being offered. Uh, myself, um, I've always believed that uh, I have to deal directly with the Crown, not the industry. If the Crown wants to trigger some kind of process with me, then they and I must agree. Uh, the industry will come in at some point in time after both of us have agreed to this type of process. One is the recognition that the treaties are there and uh, international law also protects those treaties as valid contracts between uh, two, um, two sovereign states, which is what the uh, spirit and intent at the very beginning uh, with the Crown was, uh, was all about. So let's just make sure I understand this then. As, as long as, as the negotiations are sort of nation to nation, in other words, you with the crown, that's okay. And then if business wants to come in, at what point do they make their interests known? Well, industry will always come in uh, stating that they have a permit with, uh, with the NEB and they wish to exercise their permit. So uh, um, I don't know. Um, I've already uh, gone through this with TransCanada and Enbridge. And uh, when we got to a certain point, especially when it comes to traditional knowledge uh, of a particular area, I've asked them to leave because this is not a conversation I should be having with industry. It's a conversation I should be having with the Crown, uh, who is um, uh, the, uh, the ally, I guess, uh, in our, our treaties together, right? So at what point does the Crown come in, not the industry? Okay, and uh, why don't you help answer that question? At what point does the Crown come in? 
I think right off the bat, right, uh, I think the industry should go to the Crown and say, okay, we need to go through a certain area, like say through Quebec, and uh, the Crown could um, technically come in to our regional gathering where the Quebec chiefs gather and start a process at that level between the Crown and the chiefs of Quebec. I see. And from there, it goes to individual communities, and from the individual communities, they decide uh, whether or not to engage and what process they'll agree to. Well, I'm going to ask you about protests because I think you are you are no stranger. If I if I have my facts right here, if we yeah. go back 25 or 30 years, you were part of uh, a group of First Nations that were protesting the attempt to expand a golf course near Oka, Quebec, um, your sacred territory, and there were significant protests, and the army was called in. And um, I wonder whether or not you're expecting to see a repeat of some of that in Western Canada over these issues we've been discussing. You know, God, I hope not. Um, you know what, uh, Oka, uh, Oka happened. Um, we learned a lot of lessons from that. Well, at least most of us did. 
uh, we're hoping that that never happens again. And we hope that uh, the Crown has learned its lessons as well, that a lack of respect, a lack of dialogue with First Nations can often lead to these type of things. And we're hoping and praying this never happens again. But uh, who knows? What Anything we, can happen. What would you say the lesson for you was after all of that? Uh, well, mine is, uh, my lesson is uh, it showed me what happens when respect and dialogue fail. Hmm. And uh, when treaty rights are not respected. So when you have this, uh, this colonial mentality that, uh, you know, you stole this continent fair and square from us and uh, that you'll do whatever you damn well please, uh, that's a very bad recipe for the future. We got a humble We gotta bend down low, we gotta humble ourselves in the eyes of our Creator. We gotta know what He knows. We can raise each other up. Higher and higher, we can raise each other up. We gotta humble. We gotta bend down low, we gotta humble ourselves in the eyes of our Michelmas. We gotta know what he knows. We can raise each other up. Higher and higher, we can raise each other up. We gotta We gotta bend down low, we gotta humble ourselves in the eyes of an optimist. We gotta know what she knows. We can raise each other up. Higher and higher, we can raise each other up. We gotta humble. We gotta bend down low, we gotta humble ourselves in the eyes of our children. We gotta know. Chief Simon, in your experience, um, does it more often than not work to the advantage of indigenous peoples to go into business with business? Uh, or in your experience, is that more often than not a negative experience? It depends on the type of project. If you're talking about a mining operation, like say a gold mine that's going to leave uh, huge tailing ponds behind, well, it's a bit of a negative uh, when you look at the contamination and the, the health issues related to the exploitation. Uh, if you're talking about tar sands oil, uh, where, does it, where does the pipeline pass? Does it pass through a river? Does it pass through your indigenous hunting grounds? If there's a spill, what's, uh, there's a lot of factors to take into consideration. Okay, in the case of the oil sands then, what's the, in, in your experience or in the experience of your colleagues dealing with the oil sands, have the experiences doing business with private business interests been 
more good or more bad? Uh, well, if you're talking about the tar sands, uh, I've yet to deal with any company from uh, uh, who's representing any uh, any interest in the tar sands. Uh, TransCanada, Enbridge, uh, they both had their um, their proposals to us. Um, when I started looking into it, it started off as a treaty violation and uh, possibly uh, uh, indigenous the uh, crown uh, responsibilities. Uh, but it, I started to learn more and more, and as I learned, I learned about uh, the environmental impact, uh, about the carbon we're throwing into the atmosphere, uh, the Kyoto Accord, uh, the Paris Accords, and so on, and seeing where Canada is heading in with this exploitation. So now you start looking at environmental impacts and like in my community, in my, my people, we like to say, well, we think about seven generations ahead. And if we're looking at the way things are now environmentally, uh, we're not even sure if we're gonna make it past the second generation. So the, have you heard from your colleagues in Western Canada about what the environmental impacts have been uh, in the oil patch? Uh, in the oil patch, you don't get much information. Uh, they keep a lot there secret, but just below the Athabasca River, I have met some, uh, some mothers, uh, some uh, men from there, hunters, that tell me about the, uh, uh, the contamination that's leaching into the Athabasca, into the surrounding environment from the tar sands exploitation. I notice you always call it the tar sands, even though people in Alberta prefer the expression oil sands. How come? <laughs> <laughs> well, I find it hard uh, to call it oil because oil you pump out of the ground and the tar sands you mine. Uh, there's a different process there and uh, you don't have to toss, uh, I don't know how many different chemicals you're using for tar sands, so-called oil. Um, but regular oil you pump out of the ground, you just pump it out of the ground, you put it into the pipe and uh, off it goes. But with the tar sands oil, you got to mix it, you got to liquefy it, you got to superheat it, you got to divert large amounts of, uh, of natural gas to, uh, to heat this thing. So it, it gives you a lot, of, uh, a lot of perspective on the damages that might be created uh, long term if this thing were to rupture in a river or on someone's land. No, I get the science of it, but the politics yeah. of it is such that, that they consider tar sands to be a very pejorative expression, but you don't, I guess? Well, I think they'll use any term uh, that makes it, I guess, more palatable for the, uh, the general population to accept. If you start calling things tar sands, people get a kind of a negative connotation from it.
there's so many things going on right now that uh, First Nations feel disillusioned with uh, some of the promises that uh, Mr. Trudeau had made during the uh, during his uh, election campaign, and now we're almost going into we're almost in another election, and we're looking back, taking stock into what was done, what wasn't done, how it was done, and how it wasn't. So we're yeah, there's a lot of disillusionment. Do you think there is anything inconsistent with um, Indigenous culture to have First Nations buy into the oil sector, which, as you've already told us, has been responsible for so much environmental degradation on First Nations lands? Uh, to a certain extent, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's disappointing, but you have to understand uh, that Indigenous people around Fort Mackay, around Fort McMurray, uh, I really don't hold this against them at all, that they want to buy into the pipeline. You know, they, they, they made the best of a very bad situation over the last uh, 30, 40 years, and now they've gotten used to that. And I've always offered them uh, my hand in friendship and inviting them to come in and help develop here. If they wanted to develop something else rather than oil, use the, the revenues you have now and develop here in the East. The Mohawk Nation would uh, be more than happy to open its doors so that these indigenous people could kind of divest from the tar sands and go into something else. So my hand is always there for them, and uh, I, I I know it's difficult. Like you have to uh, you have to balance uh, the ideologies of the past with the needs of the the present and uh, what you foresee for the future. It's a, it's almost uh, impossible to do when you're a native leader and stuck in that situation. Well, it is tricky, and I was going to ask you about the Indian Resource Council and I think maybe a hundred other First Nations who are proposing to buy into the Kinder Morgan pipeline as business partners. Now, on the one hand, um, presumably this is a way towards some economic self-determination. On the other hand, some of the issues you just described. How do you balance all of that off? Well, uh, you have to start somewhere. Uh, let's say, uh, uh, my brothers out in Alberta decided, well, uh, yeah, they're buying into this pipeline. That pipeline goes through BC and uh, there's a confrontation and indigenous people, uh, God forbid, would, uh, would get killed or severely injured or incarcerated for a long period of time. I wonder, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that my brothers in Alberta would feel pretty bad about that and uh, would start rethinking their positions. But uh, yeah, it's... Uh Thank you. 
只管死死，只管死死。We do look around the world today, and you see the um, very concerning pictures coming out of France. The yellow vest protest there over the cost of uh, fuel. Uh, there are other protests in Zimbabwe as well. Uh, how much of this equation, namely energy security, how much of that are you worried about? Uh, very worried. Uh, actually, you balance the energy security or the harnessing of uh, of potential energies with uh, eco economic growth and you know job creation. Uh, it just, it takes a lot of strength to yield that power that, say, the prime minister has. It, it would take a prime minister with a lot of strength to turn this around and try to go in a different direction. Because uh, oil, oil isn't the future, oil is the past. Take, for example, the $4.5 billion uh, they, they invested into that pipeline, the Kinder Morgan pipeline. What if they took that four five, uh, that four point five billion and gave it to the best minds in this country, physicists, economists, engineers, and so on, to here? I have a problem. I want to transition away from this oil, and I want to harness some other type of energy that's that's easier on the economy and um, on the environment. So, if they were to do something like that, they would have no greater partners than First Nations in this country. Hmm. There would be, I don't, I don't see any way there would be any protests, uh, like you see the yellow shirt uh, uh, protest in France. But energy security has to be balanced with, yes, the economy and also the environment. Well, that's why I was going to ask. If you were not where you are, but rather in Western Canada, representing First Nations in Western Canada, do you think you would be at the table trying to sign a deal with these private sector companies in hopes of having some kind of economic benefits come to your people? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think I would be more along the lines of uh, my friend Alan Adam, when uh, Chief Alan Adam uh, near Fort Mackay, uh, when he started uh, this whole thing, he wanted to divest. He saw what the damages were. Common sense prevailed with him. But eventually, uh, I think what happened is he started to feel used by uh, environmental groups and so on. So he kind of he gave up. You know, stop fighting the curtain and just sign on the dotted line. I mean, Alan uh, showed a lot of courage for many, many years. And I think if I were out west, I would have done the same. I do want to thank you, though, because um, people may not know this. 
Um, you, you drove uh, a long time to get to that studio from Kanesatake, and we're really grateful that you would do that for us so that we could hear your views here on TVO tonight. So, Chief Simon, thanks so much for doing that. You bet. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Take good care. Take care.